has worked as, as a high school science teacher at Knoxville Catholic High School in Knoxville, Tennessee, his hometown. He first became interested in the Shroud in 1980 while thumbing through an issue of National Geographic magazine. In the past few years, he has authored several papers related uh, to the Shroud bloodstains and DNA studies, and those uh, can be found on shroud.com. Keith, Keith or John, can we get the lights dimmed a bit, please? Not, not too much. I won't be able to see them. Check with Russ as you do that, please. That, right there. That's fine. Is that too much? That's funny. start with uh, this quote. This is from Dr. Alan Adler, and this is from the last interview that Heller and Adler did together. It says, the fact is, it meets a lot of the test criteria, it being the blood, the blood on the shroud. It meets the descriptions that were requested by the medical people as to what it should look like. But the most important thing is now there's immunological evidence that it might be the blood. These sentences are what really caught my eye about the science of the shroud, particularly the last one. My own research background is in the fields of immunology and cell biology. Those are the contexts in which I want to present uh, the discussion today. I think when it comes to the blood on the shroud, there's really three things that everyone wants to know. Number one, is blood really present? Is the red stuff blood? If it's not blood, then what is it? Number two, what type of blood is it? Is it human blood? Is it animal blood? What kind of tests would you do to distinguish between these possibilities? Whose blood is it? Is the blood consistent with being from that of a human male? Is the blood consistent with being from a single person? Is there any way that you could extract information from the blood stains that would tell you exactly who that person is? These are the types of questions uh, that we're going to discuss as we go through this. What I'd like to do at the start is to very quickly talk about a so-called first-round test or presumptive test that investigators would do to look at the possibility as to whether or not blood may or may not be present. And then I want to move into the main part, which is going to talk about uh, immunological methods and some molecular biology methods. In the main part, I want to em emphasize the techniques quite a bit uh, because I think that's very important in order to gauge the significance of the results. These so-called first-round tests or presumptive tests have a, a variety of ways in which you can do them, but all of them really center on the same thing, and that's to try to find whether or not hemoglobin is present. Hemoglobin is a major component of blood. It's what allows red blood cells to carry oxygen throughout the body. To put this into context, a single red blood cell has about 250 million hemoglobin molecules. So hemoglobin is a major signature of blood, which is why it's used in these first round presumptive type tests. In fresh blood, what is often done is you take the sample and take advantage of the fact that hemoglobin has oxidase activity, which means it can take various substrate molecules and result in a color change. For aged blood, these tests can be somewhat problematic. You can get false positives because hemoglobin is not the only molecule that has oxidase activity. You can also get false negatives if you're not able to get the sample into solution very well. So what was done in these early tests is a variation on this. They chemically extracted the functional group of hemoglobin, heme, and then measured its fluorescence. That's one type of chemical test. Another type is to take the sample, add specific reagents, and then look for the formation of specific types of crystals. So this is a chemical test, but it has its ultimate readout in the microscope. 
Another way is to use spectroscopy. You uh, aim different wavelengths of light at the sample and you look for its response to that. So as far as the Stroud goes, the search for hemoglobin began in the early 70s with Frache and colleagues and Bayma Ballone, and they reported negative results. They did not conclude that blood wasn't present. They concluded that they were unable to detect it. Bayma Ballone would go on to retool his solubilization methods and would report positive results using these types of chemical methods we talked about in the early 80s. Helen Adler would also publish in the early 80s similar findings, positive detection of hemoglobin using chemical methods. By spectroscopy, Heller and Adler would report positive results in the early 80s. Uh, Baraldi would report positive results in 2008. Uh, in addition, Heller and Adler, in their studies, would report breakdown products of hemoglobin being present, particularly by Verdon and bilirubin. They went on to show with bilirubin that it was specifically present using other distinct chemical methods. Garza Valdez would report positive results for hemoglobin on Stroud blood stain fibers in the late 1990s using immunochemical methods, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. So when these type of uh, so-called first round tests or presumptive tests look very positive, what investigators then typically do is they move out to look at so-called non-heme constituents in the blood. This can involve immunological methods, which can tell you the particular species of blood. It can also give you information about ABO blood type. DNA methods can tell you the above, as well as they can tell you if the blood's consistent with being from a male or being from a female. In terms of these tests, you can think of the blood as essentially being made of two fractions. There's a cellular fraction and there's a liquid fraction known as the plasma or simply the serum. For these non-heme proteins, we're going to go up into the serum fraction, and we're going to look at two in particular. We're going to look at albumin, which is approximately 60% of total serum protein. We're going to look at antibody, which is just under 20% of total serum protein. We're going to take albumin first. So the way these studies were done is they took human albumin and then injected it into a rabbit because that rabbit will make antibodies against it. They're then going to use those antibodies as tools to look for albumin present in bloodstained fibers. So these antibodies are made in rabbits. They're directed or specific for human albumin. There's different ways you can do this, but usually what you do is you take the purified antibody and you label it or tag it with either a fluorescent tag or a chemical tag. That allows you to follow that antibody throughout the experiment. So what was done is they took Stroud samples, took white unstained fibers and bloodstained fibers looked at their reactivity with these anti-albumin antibodies. What they found is that the control white fibers were negative, the bloodstained fibers were positive. So these results suggest that albumin is present in bloodstained fibers of the shroud. This was reported by Heller and Adler in the early 80s. They would also sh uh, show using distinct chemical methods that albumin was present as well. Then we go to the uh, other part of this, antibody protein. Antibody has several names. It's also known as immunoglobulin. Antibody and immunoglobulin are exactly the same thing. Immunoglobulin is often just simply abbreviated IG. You can make antibodies to use as tools, but our own immune system has antibodies in the serum. In the human, there's approximately five different subclasses of antibodies that are present. So a similar kind of approach was used here. They used labeled antibodies to look for immunoglobulin. They found that uh, control fibers, white fibers, did not react. You only saw reactivity with bloodstained fibers. In these studies, they also included a nonspecific, irrelevant antibody that was not against blood components. It's a nonspecific antibody to use as a negative control, but it was labeled in exactly the same fashion as the experimental antibody. The nonspecific antibodies, not directed against blood components, did not react with either white fibers uh, nor the bloodstain fibers. This is important because the controls demonstrate that the antibody binding was in fact specific. So these results were reported both by Bayman Ballone and Heller and Adler in the early 80s. 
Vanilla Balone would go on to extend these findings uh, to report detection of one specific type of immunoglobulin, IgG. So what type of blood is it? Well, we've been talking about experiments using anti-human albumin and anti-human immunoglobulin. Human proteins that were purified, injected into rabbits, and then used in these types of experiments. Even though a human molecule was used to generate the antibody, that's no guarantee that that's the only type of molecule that that, that, that antibody will recognize. This is known as cross-reactivity. Heller and Adler looked at this directly in a set of uh, experiments, not with shroud fibers, but with albumin purified from different species. What they found is when they took this anti-human albumin antibody that they used and reacted it with purified human albumin, they got a very good response, as you would expect, because that's what the antibody was made against. But they also got a very good response with chimp albumin, got a good response with baboon albumin, as you move further out to less related species, the antibody activity starts to fall off. So even though the antibodies were made against human molecules, they also react with similar molecules in closely related species. Because of this, Adler would only conclude that his study showed that it's primate blood. He wouldn't extend it scientifically to say that it was human. So from these studies, cross-reactivity really precludes a definitive uh, scientific answer that it's human blood. And I'll talk about the primate human connection a little bit more in just a few minutes. Also important to note that while these studies have examined the possibility that human or primate blood may be present, technically it's unknown if blood from other animal types may also exist. This is a blind spot in all of the studies that had been done. To look at that, what you would have to do is to take antibodies against uh, albumin, for example, or immunoglobulin from all of these different species, and then you would have to directly react these with trout samples and see if you got any type of reactivity. So as far as what type of blood is it, probably the most conservative scientific conclusion to make is that primate blood has been detected or even a little more conservative, primate blood components are present. And again, I'll talk about the primate human connection uh, in more detail here in just a few minutes. So now we'll go to ABO blood typing. ABO blood typing can be done on either a fraction of the blood, the serum fraction, or the cellular fraction. If you look at what's on the surfaces of red blood cells, this is known as forward typing. If you look at what's present in the serum, this is known as reverse typing. I'm going to talk about both of these, and I'm going to start with the forward typing first. Again, to put this into context, a single red blood cell expresses about 2 million ABO molecules on its surface. ABO markers are not the only molecules that red blood cells express on their surface. They express many others, but because ABO is so important in blood transfusion, it's the most widely studied. The classification system is based on what type of molecules a person has on his or her red blood cell surface. So for example, if you're type A, then you have type A molecules on the surface. If you're type B, you have type B molecules on the surface. If you're type AB, you have both A as well as B on the surface. If you're type O, you have neither A nor B. What these look like at the structure level is shown here, and if you'll just look at this top cartoon here to start off with, each of these different shapes represents a particular carbohydrate or sugar molecule. And the first thing that's done, these are put together to make this so-called core structure. If nothing else is done to the core structure, that's type O. If a person is type A blood, they have a specific enzyme that adds a particular carbohydrate or sugar to the end of this core structure shown here, that makes the A molecule. If a person is type B, they have a different enzyme that adds a different sugar to the core structure. As shown here, that's type B. If a person is type AB, they have both enzymes. Some core structures become A, some become B. So that's really the only difference between the four blood types is the presence or absence of 
that single carbohydrate on the end of the core structure. Now the way blood typing is looked at in terms of the shroud, it was looked at a couple different ways. Uh, the results were in agreement with each other. So I'm just gonna stay with the immunochemistry way, which we've already talked about. So they took white unbloodstained control fibers and bloodstained fibers, added in labeled antibodies. In this case, the antibodies are against the A molecule or the B molecule. They washed away any antibody that did not bind. Then they evaluated microscopically uh, whether fluorescence was present or not. Just as before, they also used these nonspecific, irrelevant, uh, negative control antibodies to show that the binding was specific and evaluated these as well. The end results of these studies are shown here. They found that for the bloodstained fibers of the shroud, they were positive for both A and B in approximately equal intensities, but negative for reactivity with anti-O. Control fibers without blood stains were negative for reactivity with everything. So this led to the conclusion, first in the early 80s, but also repeated in the mid 80s with different antibodies with greater specificity, the results were in exact agreement by Bain and Blown of a blood type of AB by forward typing methods. There were some limited typing studies also done in the late 1990s by Garza Valdez. Blood type AB, but sometimes in these discussions, you'll hear things like, well, a lot of ill material types is AB, so we really don't know what the significance of this is. So just a few comments about that. Where this comes from, related to forward typing, are from so-called false positives. These AB molecules are not specific for human red blood cells. They're not even specific for humans at all. They're also found in bacteria, in fungi, in insects. Uh, just to name a few. So if you had any type of contamination present, you can get so-called false positives. Not all old blood types is AB. Some old blood types is AB, but some does not. Uh, one example is King Tut. So by these methods, he types as blood type A. Specifically in relation to the shroud and the false positive issue, it was reported that fibers at the bed of the blood stain, so white fibers taken right up against where the blood stains are, they were negative for reactivity with anti-A or anti-B. So if it were simply due to false positives, it's a little hard to imagine how it would be so compartmentalized within the blood stains and not spill out even just a little bit to the margins, although this is certainly something that could be debatable. So do we really know then that the blood is AB? Well, in a clinical type situation, a blood transfusion situation, you would never just rely on one test. You would always do a sort of one-two punch, a complementary test. You would do forward typing, where you look for the molecules on the surfaces of the red blood cells. You would also do reverse typing, where you look at <coughs> specific antibodies in the serum. And to, I'm gonna talk about reverse typing <coughs> So to help set this up, I want to talk about the fleece experiment that was performed by Gideon back in 1162. You may or may not be familiar with the story, but Gideon thought that God was speaking to him, but he wasn't really sure. So he asked if he could do a test or experiment, put a fleece or animal skin out on the ground. And he asked God, if it's really you, when I go out there tomorrow, have the ground be dry, but the fleece be wet went out there the next day, that's exactly what he found. So he felt very good about this until later in the day. <laughs> then he started second guessing himself. So he talked to God again and said, I don't want to try your patience, but I want to do a follow-up. <laughs> I want to do a complimentary type test. This time, let's go like this. I'm going to put the fleece out there again. This time, had the ground be soaking wet, it's time to make the fleece dry. If you do that, then I'll really, really know because I'll have two complementary tests and I can move forward with confidence. The Gideon story, that's exactly what happened. This is how forward typing and reverse typing work. They're complementary to each other and agree with one another. Forward typing looks at what's on the surfaces of the red blood cells, which we just talked about. Reverse typing looks at what's in the serum. Here's how the system works. 
In the serum, a person will have antibodies to what molecules they do not express. So if a person is type A in their serum, they'll have antibodies against B. If a person is type B on the surface, in their serum, antibodies against A. If a person is type O, they don't have either of these. In their serum, they're going to have both antibodies, anti-A and anti-B. Blood type AB, suggested for the shroud, they have both. In their serum, they will not have either. So in that case, you're looking for a negative result. In fresh blood, uh, these types of tests are very straightforward. They're in very good agreement with one another. With aged blood, you can run into some issues because with time, in aged samples, these antibodies may be degraded or they may be there in some fashion, but they can lose their function. The end result of this, any of these blood types can show up by reverse typing as AB. That's another part of where that all old blood types as AB comes from. It specifically refers to the context of reverse typing. Reverse typing test is absolutely dependent on these antibodies being functional, maintaining a very proper three-dimensional conformation. It's not enough, excuse me, for them simply to be present. They have to be turnkey ready. They have to be functional to get an effective readout. So because of these types of problems, reverse typing usually is not very reliable with age samples. Keep in mind, with the AB blood type, we're looking for a negative result anyway. So the argument really becomes very, very circular. It was reported that the bloodstain fibers were AB by reverse typing, but again, because of these problems, particularly with the AB blood type samples, these results are really inconclusive at best. Forward typing, the results suggest AB. Reverse typing, you really don't have that one-two punch. You, you really only have one part of the fleece. One alternative that could provide a complementary test is to use DNA methods. You can determine blood type by that method. Using DNA tests, it doesn't look at what's on the surfaces of red blood cells, so these issues of false positive are a mute point. DNA testing looks at the enzymes that modify this core structure. That might provide one additional type of complementary way to look at it. So is the blood really AB? Well, the forward typing results suggest yes. But a second confirmatory test is important. Some would say that uh, is essential. Other red blood cell surface markers. As we mentioned a few minutes ago, ABO are not the only markers that are found on red blood cells. There are many of these systems. I'm going to briefly talk about another one, which is known as MNS. It involves two molecules, glycophorin A and glycophorin B. MN antigens are expressed on red blood cells of humans as well as all closely related primates. In contrast, S antigens are expressed on human red blood cells only. Now, these molecules were examined on shroud samples at the time of those studies. This connection between humans and primates was not known. But the samples were evaluated, and these were the results. It was reported the uh, unstained fibers were MNS negative. Bloodstained fibers were positive for both MNN and most significantly for S. However, these results were in a very brief report, and the binding for the S antibody was described as fairly good binding. So the exact significance of these results uh, at the current time is a little bit unclear, although it would certainly be something that would be extremely interesting to follow up on. It's important to realize that at the time, the vast majority of these types of studies were done, really all of them that we've talked about. What was available to investigators were so-called polyclonal antibodies. Poly meaning many, so antibodies from many clones, from many cells. Each single cell makes its own type of antibody. So when you have polyclonal antibodies, no two antibodies are exactly alike. It's a mixture. 
mid post 80s monoclonal antibodies started to become available mono for one antibodies from one clone a single clone with monoclonal antibodies it's now possible to have antibodies made by a single cell the result of that is every antibody in there is an exact identical carbon copy polyclonal antibodies are good monoclonal antibodies are extremely good in 2010, some highly specific monoclonals were developed that very effectively distinguish human blood from that of closely related primates. So this might be something that would be very interesting uh, to follow up on. So what type of blood is it? Well, the studies suggest at least primate. MNS suggests possibly human. Unknown if other types may exist as well. AB by forward typing. Confirmatory tests would be important there. And then we get to the question of, well, is the blood from a male? Is the blood from a single individual? So for these, you would turn to DNA type tests. Human DNA has been isolated from bloodstain fibers on the shroud. It was reported in 1995 by Canali probably most famously by Garza Valdez in the late 1990s in his book, The DNA of God. Uh, very recently at the conference in Bari, it was reported that plant and human DNA has been isolated from dust particles vacuumed on the shroud. We'll take a look at the Garza Valdez studies first. In these studies, they reported that cloning and sequencing of uh, three genes. There's the beta globin gene, that's a subunit of hemoglobin, that's found on chromosome 11. They also reported portions of the X chromosome and portions of the Y chromosome. These latter two suggest that the blood may be from a human male. One of the issues in DNA studies is contamination. It can be difficult to tell if the DNA signal is truly coming from the article, the blood stains in this case, or if it's coming from people that have handled the article over the years. So it can be very difficult to distinguish if the DNA is truly endogenous from the sample or is simply exogenous contaminating DNA. The average person in a single day sheds approximately 400,000 skin cells, some portion of which contain DNA that can be transferred over as contaminating DNA or often just called touch DNA. There's really nothing about any of these three genes that is specific for blood cells. They're found in essentially all cell types in the body, including skin cells. So it's really unknown from these studies if the DNA truly originates from blood cells. If the DNA signal were endogenous, if it were coming from the blood stains in these samples, in humans, it would have to be coming from the white blood cells and not the red blood cells. Because in humans, red blood cells lack a nucleus. They don't contain DNA. Any signal that you see <coughs> would have to come from the white blood cells. You might be able to take advantage of this in that white blood cells are unique among all other cell types in the body. They're the only cell types that show specific DNA rearrangement. They do this as part of their normal differentiation and development. They rearrange specific receptor genes. All other cell types have these genes. They just stay very far apart from each other and are never moved. In white blood cells, again, as part of their normal development and differentiation, they're cut and spliced and moved right next to each other. So if you could evaluate this, this might offer one potential way to truly demonstrate that you have a DNA signal that is in fact coming from blood cells. Is it possible to analyze additional DNA segments other than beta globin X and Y? Well, sometimes in discussions of this, you'll hear things like, well, portions of the X and Y chromosome have been found, but the rest of the DNA is really too degraded to be useful. Well, this raises the question, if the DNA is so degraded in the first place, how is it that the X and Y and the beta globin were found? Are they simply leftovers, survivors that the investigators look through the rubble 
and they happen to find these three. That's really not how it was done. So let's take a look at that over the next couple of slides. The total human genome consists of about 20,000 to 30,000 genes. Beta globin X and Y are three of these. It wasn't as though everything else is completely degraded and these happen to be intact. They were specifically targeted. They were targeted using a technique known as the polymerase chain reaction, or just PCR for short. The way this works, you take a sample of DNA, which has a myriad of genes, you add in a probe that's specific for that particular gene that you're interested in. That probe will find that sequence among everything else, and it will amplify that sequence up to give you enough material to study. You can take the same DNA sample, add in another probe to a different gene, it will find that gene, amplify it up to give you sufficient material. Those genes were selectively targeted and chosen. This technique is so efficient that you can generate about a billion copies from one single gene in just around three hours' time. So is the DNA too degraded for analysis? Well, it could be. You would expect some degradation and some fragmentation, given the suggested age range of the sample, but modern DNA analysis has come a tremendously long way in the past 20 years, especially the past 10 years. They're able to do some incredible things with very ancient, very old, very degraded, very fragmented DNA. So the sensitivity of modern techniques has improved vastly. Any types of DNA studies, what's really important to establish is what type of heterogeneity do you have present? In other words, is the DNA pattern that you see consistent with blood from a single individual? There's a couple ways you can go with this. You can look at nuclear DNA. That's where most of the human genome is found. As we mentioned a, a bit ago, 20,000 to 30,000 total genes. Nuclear DNA is present in the cell in two copies. You get one copy from mom and one copy from dad. There's also an organelle called the mitochondria. Mitochondria's main function is to provide cellular energy. They have their own DNA. It's a much smaller genome. It's just about 37 total genes. These genes are distinct from those in the nucleus.